Um, let's look at, so this is section 14.7. Extrema. So we already have an idea of how to do this from 21A. Back in 21A, when we were finding maxima and minima, we would find the critical values by taking the derivative and setting it equal to zero or undefined, and then testing those using either the first derivative or the second derivative test. Well, we have a similar way of doing that for functions of two variables, but it's a little different. So let's look at this example. Let's say we have the function f of x, y is equal to three x cubed plus x, y squared minus nine x squared minus y squared. So we're gonna find critical points by setting both f, x and f, y equal to zero. I should point out setting fx and fy equal to zero is the same as setting the gradient equal to zero. And so what we're doing when we're finding where we might have a maximum or minimum is we're literally finding where the gradient is zero. It's kind of interesting. Um, okay. Right. So that kind of means like there's no direction you can point in where the slope is the steepest because you're essentially finding a place where, like, for example, a place like the top of the mountain, so the top of the mountain. Right, no matter which way you go, the slope is zero, is kind of the idea. All right, so let's see, fx is going to be 9x squared plus y squared minus 18x equal to zero. It's looking a little dicey. And fy is going to be a little bit easier, probably. It's going to be 2xy minus 2y. So typically, if you've got these equations and they look kind of gnarly, you want to try and deal with the one that looks a little simpler first. I would say this one, this one doesn't have any squares in it, so I'm going to look at that one first. So I'm going to factor out a 2y. I'm going to look at x minus 1. Okay, this is something I can kind of grasp. I can see either y is going to equal 0 or x is going to equal 1. I want to be very, very clear. One zero is not a critical point. X being one and Y being zero makes this equation zero, but to be a critical point, both equations have to be zero at the same time. If you plugged in one for X and zero for Y, you would get nine plus zero minus 18, which isn't zero. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take each of these conditions and plug them into this to find the corresponding other coordinates. So if I plug in Y equal to zero, I've got 9x squared minus 18x equal to zero. Factor out a 9x, and we have x minus two. So if y equals zero, I'm gonna get x equal to zero or x equal to two. So I'm getting two critical points so far. I have zero, zero, and two, zero. And then I'm gonna plug in x equal to one. So if I look at x equal to one, I have nine plus y squared minus 18 equal to zero. So that's gonna be y squared equal to nine. So y is gonna equal plus or minus three. So I have two more critical points, one comma three and one comma negative three. All right, so four critical points to test. So how do we test them? Well, to classify, Everybody. Welcome, come on in. Thank you. So, to classify, we need the second partials test. So, the second partials test. So, this is very much like in 21A, the second derivative test for maxima and minima is where you take the second derivative, you plug in your critical point, and then if it's positive, that means your function is concave up. So you have a minimum. And if your second derivative is negative at your critical point, your function is concave down, so it's a maximum. We're gonna do the same sort of thing here, but it's a different thing we have to calculate. So we're gonna calculate capital D. Capital D stands for the determinant of the Hessian. You don't need to know that, but it is kind of interesting. Um, there's, a, there's a two by two matrix, this is the determinant. So we're gonna calculate 
the product of fxx times fyy minus the mixed partial squared. So let's see what we've got here. So fxx is, I think the derivative of this is going to be 18x minus 18. FYY, taking the derivative of this exact y is going to be 2x minus 2. And FXY, taking the derivative of this with respect to y is going to be 2y, which is the same as FYX, which it should be typically, right? FYX and FXY, most of the time should be the same. All right, so now let's do I have enough room. I probably have enough room. Let's make a little table. So we have our critical point. Our critical points are zero, zero, two, zero, one, three, one, negative three. And then we're going to calculate D, which is going to be our FXX, FYY, minus FXY squared by plugging in the point. So when we plug in zero, zero, so FXX is going to be negative 18. FYY is going to be negative two. And FXY is going to be zero. So that's going to be 36. Okay. Notably, we can also see that both FXX and FYY are concave down. I should say the function is concave down to the x direction and the y direction. If x, x, if f, x, x is negative, concave down in the x direction. If f, y is negative, concave down in the y direction. So if this d thing is positive and you look at the sign of f, x, x or f, y, y. Sorry, that's a little messy there. If that is negative, then we have a the conclusion is we have a maximum, a relative maximum, I should say. So if D is positive, you can have a relative maximum or a relative minimum. Let's actually look at the next critical point. So we plug in two zero, FXX when I plug in two is gonna be 36 minus 18. FYY when I plug in two is gonna be two. And then FXY, when I plug in zero for Y, is still going to be zero. This is also 36. But now the sign of my second derivative is with respect to X and Y are both positive, which means the whole thing is concave up. So we have a relative minimum. Okay, let's look at one, three. So, when, oh, oh, yeah, okay, I'm graph this too. So when I plug in one, three, so one for X, three for Y, I'm getting. Zero for fxx is zero for fyy. So zero times zero minus fxy is two times three. So minus six squared. That's going to be negative 36. We only care about the sign of the second derivative, fxx or fyy, when d is positive. When d is negative, the sign doesn't apply, and we have a saddle point. So so how do I get the sign of which? Sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't see your question until just now. So this sign here, I think what, is what you might be referring to, this is the sign of your, yeah, so I'm just plugging in the point to the second derivative. So when I plug in 0, 0 to fxx, right, so what this says, in case it's hard to read, and it's a little hard to read, this says the sign of fxx or fyy. So I'm just plugging in the point 0, 0 into fxx. Oh, it's negative. Or the point zero zero into fy. Oh, it's negative. Same deal here. Plugging in two zero when I plug it into fxx. Oh, it's positive. Or when I plug it into fy. Oh, it's still positive. Something worth knowing: if d is positive, then fxx and fy have to have had the same sign because you have something times something minus something squared. If this whole thing is positive. Well, these two things better multiply to a positive because the other way this number minus a square number is going to be positive is if this was already positive to start. So when D is positive, FXX and FYY have to have the same sign, which is why we only check one of them. Right? You can check FXX or FYY. There is no need to check both. All right, let's look at this last one. When I plug in one for FXX and FYY, again, I get zero. 
And when I plug it in for f, x, y, I get, let's see, negative three times two is negative six squared, which is equal to negative 36. Again, when d is negative, we don't care. We know we have a saddle. It is worth looking at what this looks like. So let's write that. Sorry, let me reshare my screen. Sorry, screen so if we so if we actually put this into well, I cannot see it all. It's really really bright. Okay, cool. So I think we would get z equal to three x to the third plus x y squared. Whoops, not equals plus. Sorry, it's hard to type things when you can't see the type. Um, what have I got? I'm sorry. Where'd you go? Minus nine x squared minus y squared. Ah, I knew I was doing that before I even did it. Okay, when you look at this thing, you can see it looks wacky, first of all, right? But you can see, okay, you can kind of see at the origin there, right? At the origin, there's your relative maximum, which we definitely said we had, right? We said we had a relative maximum at the origin. Kind of cool. And then at two zero, right? Can we look at two, two zero? Oof. You can kind of see it. Not really. I, I, I'm, li I'm a liar if I, if I say I can see that. I can't really see the. I can't really see what's happening at two zero. It looks kind of wacky. The problem is when you plug in two zero, the value is probably something like three times eight, which is twenty four, minus oof, nine times four, which is thirty six. So it's negative something. Yeah, sorry. Sometimes the graphs aren't always super illuminating, but they're still fun to play around with. I really want to know. This, oh, there we go, there we go, you gotta go way out. Now look at this thing. You can, it's, mm, he says, well, try, you can kind of see in there, you should play with it on your own. That's what you should do. <laughs> but it's kind of neat. You can totally see saddle points and stuff. I'm actually gonna just minimize this. I might use it again. Okay, so the sum up is find critical points by setting fx and fy equal to zero. Calculate D for each critical point. If D is negative, you have a saddle at that point. If D is positive, you have a max or a min. To see if it's a max or a min, you have to test one of the second derivatives. If the second derivative is negative, you have a max. If the second derivative is positive, you have a min. That's the whole story for finding and classifying relative extrema of two of functions of two variables. Well, it's not the whole, whole story. It's most of the story. Let's look at some more examples. See here. Let's look at the following. Let's look at f of let's look at this. That's kind of fine. X y equal to two. Let's put hunched over. Equal to two x to the fourth minus four x y plus y squared. Let's go ahead and find our partials. So fx is going to equal 8x cubed minus 4y. And set that equal to zero. And fy is going to equal negative 4x plus 2y. So of the two of these, I feel like it's easier to deal with the second one. And that one looks less complicated. Here, I don't just get values though, right? Like I don't get a specific point, I get an equation. So using this one, I'm gonna say two y equals four x, so y equals two x. Again, I still don't have any critical points, but I have at least, I know how x and y have to be related. And then I'm gonna plug that in to the equation over here. So that's gonna become eight x cubed minus four times two x is eight x equal to zero, and then I can factor. So this is gonna become 
eight X times X squared minus one equal to zero. So I'm gonna get three values, X equal to zero, plus or minus one. So I'm gonna get three points. I'm gonna get the point when X is zero, Y is zero. When X is one, Y is two. When X is negative one, Y is negative two. So those are my three critical points. And then, actually, D for each. So let's go ahead and find D down here. So D is FXX times FYY minus FXY squared. So FXX is going to be 24X squared. FYY is going to be FY, FYY is going to be two, and FXY is going to be negative four. This one's pretty easy to calculate, right? That's just 48X squared minus 16. So it really only depends on the value of X. So let's plug in zero, zero. So D of zero, zero is going to be zero minus 16, which is negative. So we have what? You have a max, min, or saddle. Well, I haven't even checked the second derivative, so I can't have known if I have a max or a min yet. It must be a saddle. So it's always a saddle when the, this, the determinant of the Hessian is negative. Plug in one, two. So D of one, two is gonna be, well, let's see, plugging in one for X, I get 48 minus 16, that's definitely positive. So now I have to check one of the second derivatives. Now here's the thing, we know that FYY is two. So FYY is positive, which means that second derivative is positive, which means it's gotta be concave up. So since FYY is positive, we know that we have a relative minimum. Concave up. Plugging in negative one, negative two, I bet we're gonna get the same thing. I plug in negative one for X, I still get 48 minus 16, which is 32, which is still positive. And then FYY is still also positive because it's always two in this problem. So I also have a relative minimum. I do think graphically this one is a little easier to see what's going on. So let's take a look at the graph. Okay. Let me click on them. Wow, wow, I'm really, really winning here. <laughs> okay, so this one is a little easier. It's z equal to two x to the fourth minus four x y plus y squared. Let me zoom in like a normal version. Wow. <laughs> Let's try this. There we go. There we go. Now it looks normal. So you can totally see the two relative minima, right? Right there and right there. And in the middle, you can see that saddle point. I mean, it looks kind of like a pair of, I mean, not the best pair of pants ever, but it kind of looks like a pair of pants for a person who's really kind of flat, not very wet, but you, and also twisty. But totally, right? You can see the saddle point right there in the middle. Kind of neat. I always think saddles look neat. Like they just look neat to me. They really do look like a pair of pants um, or like a saddle because why would, right? They're called a saddle for a reason. Um, yeah. So let's see here. Welcome. Thank you. Let's look at another example. Let's say our function is x squared times y to the fourth. So our fx is 2x times y to the fourth. Fy is 4x squared times y cubed. And if we set this equal to zero, setting this equal to zero, we get either x equal to zero or y equal to zero. So then this equal to zero, we get the same thing. So it is in fact true that zero, zero is a critical point here. 
Um, how do you know you want to use FXX or FYY to check for a relative maximum? So you know that we, we know that we need to use them if D is positive. So if D is positive, we check either one. You can, it doesn't matter which one you check. If D is positive, they have to be the same sign. So check FXX or FYY to see if we have a max or a min. To see, really, I should say, to see if we have a max or a min based on the concavity. Right? I would really encourage you to remember that when you're checking FXX or FYY, you're asking yourself, oh, what's the concavity of this function? And then if it's concave up, you have a minimum. If it's concave down, you have a maximum. Otherwise, you might think, oh, positive is max, and then get the wrong thing. So. Think about concavity. Um, so here, my critical point is zero, zero. And if I calculate D, FXX is going to be 2Y to the fourth. FYY is going to be 12X squared Y squared. And FXY is going to be 8XY cubed. And plugging in zero, zero is not great. I plug in zero, zero, I get zero times zero times zero minus zero, that's uh, zero. That's not helpful. So when D is zero, the test fails. It's not conclusive, and which is very similar to in 21A, when you would use the second derivative test, if the second derivative was zero at your critical point, the test would fail. You couldn't tell if it was a max or a min or maybe an inflection point. Um, so there are things you can do at this point. So x squared times y to the fourth. If I plug in any value besides zero, zero, what kind of output are we going to get? Is it going to be positive? Is it going to be negative? Is it going to be some of both? What's happening? What if we plug in something that's not just zero, zero? Could I get a negative result? I sure can't. X squared times Y to the fourth, no matter what X is, X squared is positive, unless it's zero. No matter what Y is, Y to the fourth is positive. So even though this test fails, we know that X squared times Y to the fourth is greater than or equal to zero for all points X, Y, which suggests that we must have a minimum here. Because when you plug in zero, zero, you get an output of zero. So even though this test fails, we can see because of this, this means that zero, zero is in fact a relative minimum. Excuse me. So sometimes people will ask questions like this, where the second derivative, where the, the D test fails, and they've pro they'll give you something that it's relatively not too terrible to see that it's still going to be a maximum or a minimum. Another common example is something like, um, we won't do this one, but I'll tell you, like, basically, if you, saw, if you see something that's always positive, except it's going to be zero somewhere, it's a real good bet the test is going to fail, and it's going to be either a max or a min. So another couple of examples like this would be like f of x, y equal to x to the fourth plus y to the fourth. Right, that one also, you can definitely see that it's always non-negative. So zero, zero is probably going to be a relative minimum. And the D test fails. We won't do this one, but you should do it on your own. You can definitely show that you have a relative minimum and the test fails. Um, let's look at another example. Let's look at f of x, y equal to x cubed times y cubed. So let's see, f, x is 3x squared, y cubed. Set that equal to zero, you get x equal to zero, 
y equal to zero. And you're going to get the same sort of thing for Fy. So you get, um, sorry, one second here. Uh, 3x cubed y squared. So we still have the critical point of zero, zero. And if we try and test it again, we're going to get the same sort of terrible result. Here, d is equal to fxx, which is 6xy cubed times fxy, which is 6x cubed y, minus fyx, which is going to be 9x squared y squared squared. And when you plug in 0, 0, you're going to get 0 again. So what's this going to be? So this one's a little harder, I feel like, to justify personally. Um, yeah, how would I justify this one? What have I written? Yeah. So one way you can justify this is to look at a lot of different paths. Along y equals x, we let y equals x, which definitely goes to the origin, which is what our critical point is. Our function looks like f of x, y. If I plug in y equal to x, I'm going to get um, x to the sixth, which looks kind of like an upward opening parabola. But if I plug in, say, y equal to negative x, which also goes to the origin, f of x, y, this is going to look like negative x to the sixth. So one way it's upward, the other way it's downward, and that kind of thing is a saddle. So again, this is not like super rigorous. Right? You kind of have to just, it's, it's kind of a, what can I come up with kind of situation. Um, we can definitely look at the graph of it. And yeah, I think we can see that it looks like it. That looks funky. It's kind of neat. I feel like my old graph is still on there. Why would my old graph still be on there? Oh, there it goes. It finally went away. Yeah. Right. We can see that's a saddle. That looks saddleish. It's definitely looks like someone could sit in that like a saddle. All right. Let me give you all the one to work on. Let's see here. All right, I thought I had one of those. Mm -hmm. Sorry, one second. Let's see. Let's try this one. X y is equal to x squared plus six x y plus 10y squared minus 4y plus 4. So I want you to find and classify the critical points. And I'm not going to lie, I really need to use the restroom, which is why I'm giving you, I mean, I would have you work on a problem anyway. Like, I'm going to use the restroom. I'll be right back. Work on the, oh, you might want to see the thing I'm writing. Sorry. There's your function, x squared plus 6xy plus 10y squared minus 4y plus 4. Find your critical points and then check D to see if they're maxes or mittens or saddles. And I'll be back momentarily.
Let's go. Any other points? All right, let's take a look. So fx is 2x plus 6y. That's it, right? 2x plus 6y. Set that equal to zero. We're going to get, I would probably solve it as 2x equal to negative 6y, x equal to negative 3y. It's going to be easier to substitute into the other equation than y equal to negative. Uh, one third x, right? So make your life easier if you can. Fy, let's see, it's going to be 6x plus 20y minus 4. Plugging in x equal to negative 3y, I have negative 18y plus 20y minus 4 equal to 0, or 2y equal to 4. So y equals 2, x equals negative 6. Well, that's convenient, only one critical point. So now we need to find D. So FXX is gonna be two. Okay, so as I'm going along here, I might as well make notes. FXX is two. So no matter what my critical point is, if I plug in, if I, if I look at my second derivative here, it's concave up. So either I'm gonna have a relative minimum if D is positive, right? Because I can't have a maximum or I'm gonna have a sound. But at this point, I can observe, oh, there's no way I could have a relative maximum. FYY is equal to, let's see, what is FYY, 20? And FXY is six. So there's no point, to, there's not actually a place to plug this in. So my D at this point here is just, 2 times 20 minus 6 squared, which is 4, which is positive. So when D is positive, we have a max or a min. But we know since our second partials are both positive, we have to have a relative minimum. It always feels weird, like you're plugging this in, but there's nowhere to plug it in. Sometimes that happens. Yeah. Uh, for the FYY. Yes. Equal to 20. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I wrote right. Yeah. Okay. Other questions. Let's look at another thing that's related. So let's find, yeah. So just like in 21A, we found relative maximum uh, minima by finding the critical points and then determining if the maximum in. We can also find absolute extrema on a closed interval in 21A. We can do the same sort of thing here. We can look for absolute extrema on a closed boundary. So let's say we have the following. F of x, y, we want to, I should say, we want to find the absolute extrema of f of xy equal to 3 plus xy minus x minus 2y on the triangular region Um, I'm just going to draw it. It has corners at zero, zero, or with vertices, I suppose I should say. With vertices, zero, 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 five, and five, zero. So this triangle here. 
So way back when, 21A, the way we did this was by finding, like on an interval, we'd find any critical points, and then we would test those critical points and the end points in the original function to see what values were the biggest, what values were the smallest. The same kind of thing is true here. We're going to find any critical points. We're also going to test any corners and also any critical points along one of the boundaries. Let me show you what I mean. So first, critical points. As usual. So we're going to take our partials. Fx is y minus 1. Fy is x minus 2. So we're going to get the point 2 comma 1. Your critical point does need to be in the region. So if this point had been like 3, negative 4, which is it down here, that's not in the region, we wouldn't consider it. The 2, 1 definitely is in the region. We need to check the corners. So 0, 0, 0, 5, and 5, 0. And then we need to check along the walls or the boundaries. So there are three of them. So along the wall, y equals zero. So what we're literally going to do is we're going to take our equation and plug in y equal to zero. So we're going to have f of x comma zero, and it's equal to three plus zero minus x minus zero. If we take the partial of that, well, there's no point in taking the partial with respect to y, because the partial with respect to y would just be zero, because you're literally along where y is a constant. So our partial with respect to x is negative one. Oh, that doesn't ever equal zero. Nope. So we have no critical point on this wall. And the same is going to be true along the wall x equal to zero. f of zero comma y is three plus zero minus zero minus two y, which is three minus two y. And we take the partial of that, we get negative two, which again doesn't equal zero. So no critical point along that wall either. But along the slanty wall here, y equal to five minus x, I think we're gonna get a critical point. So I'm gonna plug in five minus x for y, so I'm gonna have f of x comma five minus x, which is gonna be three plus x times five minus x, minus x minus two times five minus x. You should definitely simplify this. So that's gonna equal three plus five x, minus x squared, minus x, minus 10, plus 2x, and simplifying a little more, it's gonna be negative x squared, 5x minus x is 4x, plus 2x is 6x, and then three minus 10 is minus seven. So taking the partial derivative of that, we're gonna get negative 2x plus six equal to zero. We're gonna get x equal to three, and then y is equal to five minus x, so we're gonna get y equal to two. That is a three. Oops, sorry. So we have one, two, three, four, five points to check. And I think I can fit it all up here. So f of zero, zero is, I plug in zero for x and zero for y, I get, Three plus zero minus zero minus zero. I right, started with zero, zero, it's just our score. It doesn't really matter. F of zero, five, gonna be three plus zero minus zero minus 10. So negative seven. F of five, zero is three plus zero minus five minus zero. Um, plugging in 2, 1, f of 2, 1 is, I'm just going to do the math, 3 plus 2 minus 2 minus 2. 
and f of three two. Three plus six is nine, minus three is six, minus four is two. Okay, so which one's the biggest? Um, it looks like three is the biggest. So here's our absolute maximum. And which one's the smallest? It looks like negative seven. There's our absolute minimum. So we can say this function has an absolute maximum at the point zero, zero with a value of three. We say it has an absolute minimum at the point zero, five with a value of negative seven. It's kind of a funky process, but it always works. So you're always going to be always testing the corners, any critical points in the region, and then any critical points along each of the walls. Questions about this one? Yeah. So for the last step, it's like after we find, uh, like after we find the uh, all the test points, all the critical all the points. points. You're good. Those back into the original formula. Right, exactly, which is different than what you do when you're finding relative extrema. Right? For relative extrema, you use D and you're like, oh, is it positive? Is it negative? What are you? Whereas here, exactly, you're taking all your critical points, your corners, your wall points, your points in the middle, and plugging them into the original function to see what value is the largest, what value is the smallest. I have Should we do one more of these? I feel like another one of these would be good practice. I asked the question, but I'm not going to take your. I'm just going to say yes. We should do another one of these. Let's do one more, and then we'll talk. Yeah, we'll talk about Lagrange a little bit. So, where'd you go? So again, we want to find the absolute extrema. of f of x, y equal to x squared plus x, y plus y squared on the triangle bounded by the vertices negative two, negative one, one negative one, and one two. And it's not absolutely necessary to draw a picture, but I do find the drawing a picture helps because drawing the picture helps you see what the bound the boundaries are, right? In the previous problem we did, right, drawing the triangle, connecting those vertices made it easy for me to see that y equals zero and x equals zero and y equal to x minus five. Ooh, five minus x, which is what I did, sorry made it easy to see that those were my boundaries. So I do think drawing the picture of the region is probably worthwhile and not hard, right? We're just connecting some dots. So negative two, negative one, one, negative one. Oh good, they're at the same height. That makes it easier. And one, two. Well, cool, that's gonna be pretty straightforward. So we have the point. One, two, one, negative one, negative two, negative one. This line, this wall here is the line x equal to one. This is the line, the wall y equal to negative one. And this one here it looks like it's y equal to x plus one. So I'll make it easier to kind of deal with everything in a minute. All right, so we have our corners. Then I don't need to write them again, right? You can see what they are. Those are my corners. Let's find our critical points. So Fx is 2x plus y. Fy is 2, ah, is x plus 2y. I'm going to write 2y plus x. Um, be careful with these. Some of these people, like, I see people do these problems and they get kind of a little 
how that has to do with what was left. The easiest way to handle this is to solve y in terms of x and then plug into the other y. So y equals negative 2x. So then 2 times negative 2x plus x equals 0. So I have negative 4x plus x equals 0, oh, negative 3x x equals 0. So y equals 0. Great. So 0, 0 is my critical point. And then let's find our walls. So along the wall, x equal to 1. So I'm just plugging in 1 for x. So f of 1 comma y is 1 plus y plus y squared. And then the partial derivative is 1 plus 2y equal to 0. So you're getting y equal to negative 1 half. So we have a point, x is one and y is negative one half, which is not the corner. So there's a point right there. You don't have to mark it on the thing. I just felt like it. because. Uh... And then if we look at the wall, y equal to negative one, we're gonna have f of x comma negative one equal to x squared minus x plus one. The partial derivative is gonna be two x minus one equal to zero. So x is gonna equal positive one half. So we get the point one half comma negative one. And finally, along the wall y equal to x plus one, We have f of x comma x plus one, which is gonna be x squared plus x times x plus one plus x plus one squared, which I probably would multiply out. It's x squared plus x squared plus x plus x squared plus two x plus one, which is three x squared plus three x plus one. So then, the partial derivative is going to be fx is 6x plus 3. So x is going to equal negative 1 half. And y is going to equal negative 1 half plus 1, which is 1 half. So you get the point negative 1 half, 1 half is right there. It's kind of a lengthy process, right? You're like, okay, find all these points, and now we're going to put them all into the function. So let's see, so I have zero, so let's say I'm gonna have f of zero, zero, I'm gonna have f of all my corners, f one, negative one, f of one, two, and then all of my wall points. So f of, this was one negative one half, this one is one half comma negative one, And then, I'm oh, sorry, you guys can see that down there, apologies. And then f of negative one half, negative one half. All right, we can do this, it's not too bad. Zero, zero is easy, zero, oh, let's write the function over here just to remember it. So f of x, y is x squared plus x, y plus y squared. Hmm. I'm just thinking there's a way to make this easier. I just don't know if it's really, no, it's not necessary. It's gonna be zero. It's gonna be four plus two plus one. This one's gonna be one minus one plus one. It's gonna be one plus two plus four. It's gonna be, okay, now, now I think it's a little bit harder. Be one minus one half plus one fourth, which is going to be one minus two fourths plus one fourth is three fourths. And then we're going to have, let's see, probably about the same. It's going to be one fourth minus one half plus one, which is also three fourths. And finally, one half, one half, we get one fourth 
plus one fourth, plus one fourth. Okay, so what is our rel our absolute minimum value? Anybody? Is it three fourths, three fourths, three fourths, seven, one, seven, or zero? I know you know. You can tell me. You can say a thing. Which of these numbers is the smallest? And there's another one that's smaller. Zero. Zero is the smallest. So our this is where we have our absolute min minimum. Now the answer to the absolute maximum is a little dicier because there are two places where you have the highest value here and here. So they're both absolute maximum. Maxima, I should say. So both that and that are absolute maxima. You can have more than one absolute maximum or absolute minimum. It is totally valid. Whoops. That was good. It'll be all right. Okay. Oh, yeah. So then, not Lagrange yet. We have other things to do. Sorry. I was all excited about Lagrange. Not yet. We also look at multivariable optimization. So the reason is multivariable optimization problems. And this is where you kind of have choices sometimes. So depending on how the problem is set up, you might approach solving a multivariable optimization problem using the methods we've talked about. Writing it as a function of two variables, finding where it is a maximum or minimum, depending on what you have. But we'll talk about on Thursday how you can also do it using the method of Lagrange multipliers, which is interesting. So let's look at this first example. Find the dimensions of the least expensive rectangular box, also known as a parallel pipette, if the material for the top and bottom costs twice as much as the material for the sides. Now, if I just said that, it wouldn't be a very good question because you can say, well, James, I'm going to design a box that holds nothing and it's going to be free. So I have to have one more piece of information and the volume must be some amount. Let's say it's going to be 16 cubic feet. So I want to design the cheapest possible box that is 16, that holds 16 cubic feet. Let's draw a picture. So here's my box. I have no idea what the dimensions really are. Just kind of drawing it. And let's call the sides X, Y, and Z. And if I want to write the volume, the volume, well, actually, the volume is not where I should be starting really because the volume is not on me. What am I actually trying to maximize here? Or sorry, I'm not trying to maximize anything. What am I trying to optimize? What am I trying to do? I want to make the boxes the least expensive. So I'm trying to minimize. the cost. So to be able to minimize the thing, we need to be able to write an equation for it. So I have arbitrarily labeled this. We have been told that the top and bottom cost twice as much as the material for the sides. When I do this, I like to make up numbers. Some people just like do whatever. I'm going to say the sides cost $1 
per square foot. And the top and bottom cost $2 per square foot. You could literally make up any numbers you want. 10 and 20, 100 and 200, as long as one of them is twice the other one. You'll see why in a second. So then we want to write the equation for the cost. So the cost is going to equal, well, the area of the bottom is x times y. And the bottom costs $2 per square foot. So the cost for the bottom is going to be 2 times x times y. But the top is going to be the same as that. So let's just double it and say it's going to be 4 times x times y. $2 per square foot times 2xy square feet. And that's what we're really doing. I'm just not writing the, the units of money because we don't really need that. For the front and the back, the front area is xz, the back area is xz, so I have 2xz, and those cost $1 per square foot. So really this is, right, this is your $1 times 2xz square feet. And similarly, the left and the right side are gonna be two yz's worth of area times one dollar per square foot. Now, I just want to point out, if I'm going to minimize this, what I'm eventually going to do is take the derivative set equal to zero. And it doesn't matter if this is multiplied by two or by 20 or by 2000, multiplying this whole thing by a constant doesn't affect what the critical values are, or the critical points you're going to use. That's why I was saying, you can say this is one dollar per square foot and two dollars per square foot, or 10 or 20 or 100 or 200, right? Because all that's going to do is change what we've multiplied this by as far as the constant, which isn't going to change your critical points at all. But the other issue here, and it is an issue, is that this is a function of how many variables? Three. We just spend a lot of time maximizing and minimizing functions of two variables. So just like back in 21A, your function has too many variables in it, and you have to use your constraint to eliminate one of those variables. So we are constrained. Right? There is some limiting piece of information. In this particular problem is that the box needs to hold 16 cubic feet of volume. So the volume, which the equation for the volume is x times y times z, had better hold 16 cubic feet. And that constraint equation we're going to use to eliminate one of the variables in our function. So typically, if we have a choice, all things being equal, I would eliminate z because I'm used to working with x and y. Maybe, so it depends on how it looks. Like if this looked really terrible to like plug in for z4, I would do something different. But here, it's virtually the same in all the variables. So I'm going to take this equation and say z is equal to 16 divided by x times y. And to plug that in for each of my z's. So now my cost equation as a function of just x and y is equal to 4xy plus 2x times 16 over xy plus 2y times 16 over xy. You should definitely simplify this before you start finding any um, critical points. So my cost function is 4xy plus I can cancel an X here and get 32 times Y to the negative first, plus 32 times X to the negative first. Not too bad. So now we're gonna find the critical points. All right, so the partial derivative with respect to X is gonna be four Y minus 32 x to the negative second. And the partial respect to y is gonna be very similar. It's gonna be four x minus 32 y to the negative second. All right, I would probably rewrite both of these. I would probably write both of these as, this is four y minus 32 over x squared equal to zero or 4y equal to 32 over x squared. Or dividing both sides by four, y equal to eight over x squared. And before I plug that in over here, I'm gonna rewrite this. 
So this is going to be 4x minus 32 over y squared equal to zero. All right, so this is where things do get a little bit messy. So we're going to plug in y into this other equation. So let's see, we're going to have 4x minus 32 over 8 over x squared squared. Great, I know how to flip and multiply. This is going to be 4x minus 32 times 8 squared is 64, x squared squared is x to the fourth. So it's going to be times x to the fourth over 64. Next, I flip the multiply. And now I can simplify this. This is 4x minus x to the fourth over 2 equal to 0. What's something really easy I can do to make this problem just a little bit easier? And I said easy twice. I meant it both times. What's a simple thing I can multiply both sides by to make this just a little better? Right, exactly. I don't want fractions. I don't need fractions. So multiply both sides by two. And I've got 8x minus x to the fourth equal to zero. And the wrong thing to do here is to bring the x to the fourth over to the other side and divide both sides by x, even though you'll get the right answer. The right way to do this is to factor out an x. And then you're going to get x equal to zero or x equal to two. One of those is not a good answer. I don't want to make a box where one of the side lengths is zero. It's going to be not very useful for holding stuff. So this is not a good answer. We don't want that. x equals two, we want. So now we have to do two things. Thing one, we need to check to make sure this actually gives us what we want. I don't know if this is going to make, I don't necessarily know just by doing it that I'm going to have a maximum or a minimum. I actually have to check. So we're going to check that it's a, well, I'm trying to minimize it, right? Check that it's a minimum. And I suppose I should also find the y value. So if x equals two, y is going to equal eight over four, which is also two. So if I look back at my function, oof, my function, which was, C of x comma y equal to, come on back, 4xy plus 32y to the negative first plus 32x to the negative first. Now I'm going to find my d. So d is going to be cxx, cyy minus cxy squared. cxx is, uh, okay. Lovely. So CX X is going to be 64 times X to the negative third. It's taking the derivative with respect to X. CYY is also is going to be 64 Y to the negative third. And CXY is going to be four. Great. So here's what I've got. My D is 64 over X cubed times 64 over y cubed minus 16. And I'm gonna plug in the critical point two, two. So I'm gonna get 64 over eight minus 60 times 64 over eight minus 16. That's eight times eight, which is 64 minus 16, which is definitely positive. So it's positive, which, con which way is my concavity? Is it concave up or concave down? See some thumbs. Is it concave up or is it concave down? Remember to look at the second derivative. Here's my second derivative right there, which is positive. So it's definitely concave up, which means we have a minimum. Right? Maybe, maybe you thought I was asking a different question. Maybe. So this is definitely concave up. So yes, we have a minimum. And the minimum occurs at the dimensions are x equal to two feet, y equal to two feet. Oh, we didn't find z. z equal to, well, z was 16 over x times y. So z is 16 over two times two, which is four feet. 
So that is our least expensive box that will hold 16 cubic feet if the sides cost twice as much or half as much as the top and bottom. I will tell you if all the sides cost the same, the box would have ended up being a perfect cube. We will probably revisit this question again in through the guise of Lagrange. Um, yeah, let's see what time is it. We can do another one. I think we have, uh, yeah, I would, yeah, okay, let's do one more. And then next time we'll do this problem again, but with Lagrange multipliers. So, Want to find this is like this is like a classic like every class typically goes this question. This is a classic twenty one C optimization question. Find the dimensions of the largest rectangular box. So as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, okay, I'm trying to maximize volume, right? If someone says the largest three dimensional thing. They mean the three dimensional thing that has the most volume. The largest rectangular box that can be mailed under the US Postal Service requirement that length plus girth must not exceed 108 inches. So let's draw a picture. Here's a box. We'll call this X, Y, Z. Let's say that the length is equal to Z, although really you could call it any of them. If the length is equal to Z, then the girth is the around part. The girth is X back, let's just draw it. So if my length is this way, my girth is kind of like a cross-sectional slice of it. So the red part there, I know you can't really see the but that's the measure of the girth. So the girth is X plus Y plus X plus Y. So basically whatever dimension your length is, the girth is the around part and the other dimensions. So we want to maximize volume. So we're trying to maximize volume equal to X times Y times Z. But we have a constraint. Our constraint is that the length plus the girth should not exceed 108 inches. And I'm not gonna write less than or equal to 108. If I'm trying to make the box as big as possible, I'm gonna use as all of the length and girth I can. So I'm gonna go all the way up to 108 inches. So just like last time, we're gonna take this function of three variables that we wanna maximize and use our constraint to eliminate one of the variables. So we're gonna say, oh, look, we're gonna solve for Z. Z is 108 minus two X minus two Y. And we're gonna substitute that in for Z in the thing we wanna maximize. So we wanna maximize volume equal to X times Y times 108 minus two X minus two Y. And I think we should multiply it out to make it easier to find all our partials. So V is gonna equal 108 X Y minus two X squared Y minus two X Y squared. Something you might start to notice, a lot of these functions have symmetry. When I say symmetry, I mean, if you were to interchange X and Y in this equation, it would still be the same equation. A lot, of that a lot of the time when that happens, that leads to solutions that look like X and Y having the same value. So just something to be aware of. I'm seeing the symmetry here. I'm pretty confident 
X and Y are going to end up having the same value. Not that we need to know that, but it's just good to kind of think about what's going to happen. So let's find our partials. Vx is 108y minus 2x, sorry, 2 uh, minus 4xy, apologies, minus 2y squared. And Vy is going to be similar. I'm going to work with this one first before I write down Vy though. So setting this equal to zero, I seem to notice I can factor out a y. I have y times 108 minus 4x minus 2y. To me, they're going to get y equal to zero. That's not going to be good. Or 108 minus 4x minus 2y equal to zero. And in a similar way, setting vy, well, finding vy, it's going to be 108x minus 2x squared minus 4xy. I can factor out an x here. And I'm left with pretty much exactly the same thing as I was over here, except x and y have interchanged their roles. That's also why it's good to pay attention to the symmetry because you're going to get the same equation popping up again. You get x equal to zero, which we don't want, or 108 minus 2x minus 4y equal to zero. Normally, I would solve for one and plug into the other one, but seeing as how things look not too terrible here, I'm, I don't know. I, don't know. I, I could just multiply this by negative two and then add it to this one. So I'm going to multiply this by negative two and get negative 216 plus 4x plus 8y equal to zero. And then when I add these together, 108 plus negative 216 is negative 108. Negative 4x plus 4x is 0x. And negative 2y plus y is 6y. So 6y equals 108. y equals 54 divided by 3 is something, 18. And then looking at my relationship between, oh, actually, I didn't, okay, that's, there's a good reason not to do that. Now I have to go back and actually work for x. So plugging this in over here, 108 minus 2x minus 4 times 18 is 72. So I get 108 minus 72 is 36 equal to 2x. Oh, yeah, x also equals 18. Are we done? Well, definitely not. Because one, I haven't found z yet, right? I at least should find the third dimension. But even then, I'm not really done. So we could find z. Z is going to be 108 minus 36 minus 36, which is also going to be 36. But the thing that we haven't done is made sure that it actually is maximizing the volume. Or maybe this is giving us a minimum volume. Or maybe it's a saddle point as far as the volume is concerned. We actually have to check. So we have to check it's a maximum. All right, so we need to find VXX and VYY and VXY. So VXX is 100, oh, nope, it's negative 4Y. That's it. Vxx is negative 4y. It seems easy. Yep, no x there. No, cool. Vyy, I bet, is negative 4x. Yep, negative 4x. Mm, yeah, that's right. And Vxy is going to be a little more interesting. It's going to be 108 minus 4x minus 4y. So my d is going to be negative 4x times negative 4y minus 108 minus 4x minus 4y squared. All right, let's plug in 18 for both x and y. So negative 4 times 18, let's see, 2 times 18 is 36, and another 2 is 72. So it's going to be a negative 72 times a negative 72 minus... 72, so I just said 4 times 18 was 72. So I have 108 minus 72 minus 72 squared. So here I have 
negative 72 times negative 72 minus 108 minus 72 is 36, minus 72 is negative 36. So let me ask you all, is this thing positive or negative? What's bigger, 72 squared or 36 squared? 72 squared. So this part's bigger, so this part minus this part has to be positive. That means we have a max or a min, but since my second derivative is negative, we definitely have a maximum because it's concave down. So yes, a maximum at x, y equal to 18, 18. And so just to confirm our dimensions are x equal to 18 inches, y equal to 18 inches, and z equal to 36 inches. So the biggest box, or I should say the box with the most volume that you can send to the US Postal Service is a box that is 18 inches wide by 18 inches deep by 36 inches tall. <laughs>